Hello! <laughs> Welcome to Archival Adventures uh, here from Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives. I, sorry, I think I just hit the mic. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here. Um, and on today's episode, episode number 27, we are visiting once again um, the topic of backyard grilling through our rare books collection. Uh, today is the last day or the, the last stream in August or July it's July it's the last stream in July and it's the last uh, stream for now that will cover this topic um, so we're gonna try and get through kind of like the 1960s through today in two hours um, and then next week we're gonna pick up it's gonna be a sort of a tangent we're gonna be going into um, folk medicine, traditional medicine, uh, home remedies, that type of stuff. Uh, we have some interesting materials there. Uh, so that is what we're going to look at next week. I think that might be one or two weeks that we we'll do that. Um, so we'll see. It should be a good time. Um, I do see that we just had a raid come in on the Rogan27 channel. Welcome 16-Bit Eric and uh, welcome Whimsies to Archival Adventures. This is my, um, my Wednesday show. I co-stream on VTUL Studios and on Rogan27. Um, this is a broadcast directly from the Virginia Tech Special Collections and University Archives. I am Anthony Wright de Hernandez, the Community Collections Archivist here. And um, yeah, I share materials from the archives. So right now, this week, uh, this is the last in a series of episodes that we've done uh, focusing on kind of the topic of backyard grilling and looking at it through our rare books collection. Uh, so we started in the 1890s and this week we're gonna be doing like 1960 through today. Um, through rare books looking at the topic of backyard grilling. So it should be a good time. Um, let me say hello to people that are here. Uh, Hannah, I see you. Uh, you're always here and it's always wonderful to have you here. Um, Key Squared, the stream title reminds me that a mystery novel I read recently should come with a content warning specific to librarians and archivists. Donna Andrews' Owls Well That Ends Well, the opening clue to the mystery is someone literally grilling a rare book in their backyard. Oh my. <laughs> um, hi Kung Fu Panzer and Lord Portico. Um, Subby Doby, uh, Duke of Many Things. Uh, Eagle Sight and Fluidan, welcome in. Uh, welcome everybody who's here on both channels. I do have one quick, uh, or three quick announcements that we do at the top of every one of our archival streams um, because I think that it's important to, to make these acknowledgments. So I want to acknowledge that the, uh, the Tudelo and Monacan people who are the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognize their continuing connection to the land, water, and air that Virginia Tech consumes. Uh, we pay respect to the Tudelo and Monacan nations and to their elders past, present, and emerging. I also want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Smithfield Plantation. Uh, at any point from 1774 to 1865, the Preston family enslaved 40 to 100 African men, women, and children on this land. I want to pay respect to those souls and acknowledge that Virginia Tech is undeniably tied to that legacy. Uh, further, I want to acknowledge that Virginia Tech's Blacksburg campus was previously the site of the Solitude Estate, which enslaved at least 30 African men, women, and children on this land, and acknowledge the contributions of the Fraction family and other enslaved persons in the creation and emergence of Virginia Tech as a major land-grant university. Uh, so thank you for sticking with me while I make those acknowledgments. Um, I think it's important to recognize the history of the place where we are, um, and that major universities like this didn't just spring up out of nowhere. Uh, so, let me just put my phone away so it's not going to... Are the captions not working? <coughs> Let me check on that. Um, I don't see them either. They should be on. Do, 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 do. Um... One moment. Technical difficulties. 
Where is my input device? Let's see if that made any difference. I think we have captions. Do let me know if that is accurate. And if somebody over on the VTUL Studios channel could let me know if the captions are working there. I believe that they are just from looking at the captioner, but it'd be lovely to have the confirmation. Yeah, I, I know we were messing with sound settings. So the, um, the captions, uh, the, the sound input wasn't set to the microphone. So that's all it was. Um, it's happened previously, so I w it didn't take me 15 minutes to figure out this time. You recently learned that the A in LGBTQA doesn't stand for autistic. Well, you're, you're correct. It doesn't, but that doesn't mean that autistic people aren't welcome in the LGBTQA community. Um, generally, uh, today, LGB the A in LGBTQA generally stands today for um, asexual. Uh, if you go back a few years, so this is one of the topical areas that I actually know a bit about from an archival perspective. Um, if you go back to, say, the 1990s, um, early 2000s even, when the acronym started adding the A, um, the A typically stood for allies back then, but typically today, allies is not considered as part of the acronym. Um, and the A today would be usually meant, uh, sorry, the A today usually means asexual. So, um, anyway, uh, <laughs> you can feel free to continue with that conversation and I will be happy to, um, expound upon that if needed, but I'm going to go ahead and switch us to the view so you can actually see the documents that we're going to be looking at. Um, and like I said, we're starting in the 1960s today. Uh, switch over to document focus here. Um, and the first item that I have is an item from 1961. It is the Betty Crocker's Outdoor Cookbook. Uh, so. Everything that I'll be sharing today is from our Rare Books collection, um, which doesn't necessarily mean that they're super hard to find books or anything like that. Um, the, the older ones that we have may, be, may qualify for that, uh, but we gather topical collections, and so these are, these are going to be relatively hard to find, relatively rare, or iconic books within a subject area, or connected to our institution in some way. So if it was a faculty author or something like that, we would have a copy of it in, in that case as well. Um, so I don't know specifically why each one of these was selected, and in, indeed, a lot of our cookbooks come from um, the Ann Hertzler collection, I want to say. Now I'm, now I'm going to get things wrong. Hang on one second. Uh, while I look up names, because I don't want to get it wrong. Um, history of food and drink. Sorry. Anne Her the Ann Hertzler correct collection, I had the name correct. Uh, that one is specifically children's cookbooks and l nutrition literature. Um, most of the cookbooks that might show up today probably came to us as part of the Peacock Harper culinary collection. Um, uh, Dora Greenlaw Peacock and Laura Jane Harper had collected a bunch of cookbooks privately um, as just a collection documenting the history of um, cookbooks and then donated that to us and then um, our archives built upon that to expand what we have. Anyway, uh, so the first one that we're looking at today is Betty Crocker's Outdoor Cookbook. Um, you can see the lovely illustrations on the cover here. And it has 
a very 1960s, almost, I mean, this was published in 1961. It has an almost 1970s illustrative style inside of it. Um, like, like it's like 10 years ahead of its time almost. But I can still see like the 1960s in the illustrations. This one is inscribed in the front. Uh, to Nancy King, happy birthday. Um, yours, Junie and Esther, I think. June 3rd, 1961. Um, anyway. So as we saw with some of the older volumes, like the, the camping focused volumes from the 1890s and 1900s, um, this one starts off with the basics of barbecuing in talking about the fire itself, fuels, fire starters, locating the fire, heat control, etc., cetera, uh, and then gives some stuff on equipment. Um, these are a little bit more specialized than we saw with the camping cookbooks. Um, outdoor feasts at home and away, recipes for outdoor dining, uh, and under meats we have beef, hamburgers, frankfurters, veal, lamb, pork, and poultry. Um, we don't have an exotic meats section in this one, which is interesting. Hang on one second. I thought that cord was behind me and, and it was just bugging me there. Um, ooh, there's a lovely uh, note to the reader from Betty Crocker in the front. Dear friend, who doesn't love to eat outdoors? The tantalizing aroma of sizzling chicken or steaks, the mellow glow of the coals, the hum of happy voices, it all adds up to fun for everyone. And the setting can be porch, patio, park, seashore, or stream. In this book, you'll find many interesting recipes and ideas developed for outdoor cooking and dining. And you'll find them divided into three major sections. First, the basics of barbecuing, the fire, the fuel, and heat control. Second, occasions for outdoor feasts. Backyard or terrace barbecues, shore cooking, seaside in the backyard, cooking afloat, cruising on land, pack trip cooking, breakfast cookouts, and picnics. The third, a collection of recipes for outdoor dining. From the simplest to the most exotic fare. These recipes include everything you might like to cook or eat outdoors. Meats and main dishes, vegetables, fruits, salads, breads, and desserts. We hope you'll turn to this book often for help in planning for dining al fresco. It will be as delightful and as exciting as any meal served indoors. So let's see what we've got. I'm going to flip through until something catches my eye. Uh, feel free to pop in chat and say, hey, you passed something that looked interesting, and, and I will uh, attempt to go back to it. Um, but I love that the illustrations in here. Um, OK, definitely more 1960s as I dig a little bit further into it, more 1960s than 1970s in illustrative style, which makes sense. This is 1961. Um, uh, and so this is going to be a blend of 1950s and 1960s uh, artistic influence for the illustrations. Um, we've got electric equipment for outdoor use. Thermometers. Want to get to the recipes a little bit. Ooh, we've got some photography. Again, um, actually, this is more realistically staged, I would say, than some of the photographs we've seen in other books. Um, the little basket of cupcakes looks nice. It's interesting. We have a turkey on the table in this photo. Um, I haven't seen a recipe prior to this for cooking an, a turkey outdoors, except way back when, when we were looking at the camping cookbooks. Um, most of the grilling stuff has not included how to roast an entire turkey in your backyard. So I'm curious to see if that's in here. 
since they had that in the photograph. Some interesting equipment here with the skewers for the um, uh, for the shish kebabs here. Looks like a specialized cooker just for that. Tools for the outdoor cook, backyard or terrace barbecues, steak barbecue, burger and bean barbecue, beef kebab barbecue, veal steaks barbecue, chicken barbecue. These are menus. Um, terrace, at the poolside, outdoor dinner party. Shore cooking. So this is not exactly backyard, but um, the introduction, I read like the first five words and it seems interesting. A meal cooked at the lake or seashore is quite a different challenge to the outdoor chef from the backyard barbecue since no kitchen facilities or supplies are at hand. It also is quite different from pack trip cooking, which must depend on food easily transported in greater quantity and kept fresh for perhaps several days. So I guess that makes sense. So pack trip would be like if you're going hiking or if you're going camping where you need to pack foods that will last for several days and so it's a different style of cooking it's a different preparation um, you still don't have access to a kitchen but you've got a different kind of food that you're bringing with you shore cooking what they're implying here is that's going to mostly be a day trip. You won't have access to your kitchen because you're not in your backyard. Uh, but you'll be able to prepare a lot of the same types of dishes because you don't have to pack things that will last as long. So that's interesting. Yeah, I don't, we haven't seen shore cooking in a previous one. Wait, do you see a mention of asbestos gloves? I didn't, I know we talked about asbestos gloves before. I don't see it mentioned here, but you may have noticed it. But yeah, we had that discussion in the second paragraph. Uh, the menus featured on pages 50 and 51 are for a one meal outing with items carried, usually by car, to a fairly distant site. Therefore, the first rule is to make a list of everything you may need and check off each item as it's packed. A corn roast is a disaster if asbestos gloves and butter are forgotten. Gotcha. <laughs> yeah, we had that whole conversation. I don't remember if it was last week or the week before, um, where in another cookbook, they recommended asbestos gloves um, and we talked about how that would just not be found today um, how technically probably they could be made and made safely but it's just a substance that is not used in any consumer products it's only used in specialized industrial purposes today um, so yeah you can definitely see that this is an older item Brand new technique. Seaside in the backyard. There's no need to live near the shore to enjoy the delights of barbecued fish and shellfish. Magnificent deep sea lake and mountain stream fish are now available, iced or frozen, in every one of our states. Many people automatically think of meats when they think of barbecuing. In my opinion, Fish, almost more than any other food, becomes immeasurably more tempting when grilled over charcoal, if properly basted and handled. So, we've now sort of come full circle, um, because a lot of the camping books had huge sections on fish. What, the first two weeks that we did this, we were looking at uh, chowder recipes. Uh, because they were in all of the books and we were, so we were ca comparing chowder recipes. Um, and then as we got into like the 40s and 50s, we started to see smaller sections on fish and larger sections on 
steaks and um, the hamburgers and the frankfurters and things like that. Um, and so here, it, it's interesting that they're like, hey, you don't only have to think of meat. Fish works great on the barbecue too. Because if you go back to the older books, they had huge sections on fish. Because what were you going to do? They were intended for people who were out camping and catching the food that they were going to be eating. And a lot of that was fishing. Shellfish barbecue, lobster feast, fish stew dinner, cooking afloat, uh, one burner stove dinner, hibachi dinner, cruising on land, let's pack trip cooking. So yeah, that's camping. It's interesting that they are calling it pack trip instead of just camping. Um, breakfast cookouts, picnics, brown paper bag picnic, hamper picnic. Oh, here we go. Some, I think we're to the recipe section. Recipes for outdoor dining. So beef, we've got charbroil steak, blue cheese topping for steak, steak on the coals, flank steak, grilled cube steaks, lots of steak, <laughs> various versions of steak. Look at the fish in the previous page. Oh, the illustration of the fish. He does not look thrilled. <laughs> yeah, that expression is... Um, And honestly, the same expression is in the eye of the cow. Like, you don't get the mouth of the cow, but the eye kind of has the same expression. <laughs> they, they, they don't seem too happy. <laughs> That's an interesting um, illustration. It's kind of reminiscent of heraldry. <laughs> That's cool. We do have a, a heraldry collection here as well. And so just to me, like the fact that this mimics uh, heraldry is interesting. We get a section on hamburgers. We have double double decker hamburgers in this book. Um, Still pretty basic. Uh, we don't have the onion or onion salt in these in the recipe for these burgers. Um, it's ground beef, pepper, salt, and eggs and breadcrumbs. Um, so a fairly typical recipe. Uh, they do have one uh, a variation with onion filling. Um, they also have a peppy cheese filling, uh, where you can put crumbled blue cheese or shredded cheddar cheese with mayonnaise, Worcestershire sauce, and mustard. And be calling it filling, I think, actually probably means filling. Um, this is after the point where the Juicy Lucy has become a thing, where you've got the filled hamburger with the cheese inside of it. Uh, so, barbecued cheeseburgers in foil, beef burgers, burger dogs. What are burger dogs? A double treat for teens. Hamburgers and Franks combined. Because the cookbooks by this point have presented hamburgers as adult and hot dogs or frankfurters as children's. So here we've got burger dogs presented as something for teens. Uh, a half, or, uh, we've got a pound of ground beef, two tablespoons of vegetable oil, eight frankfurters split lengthwise, 
One can, uh, eight ounces, of tomato sauce, one medium onion chopped fine, two tablespoons of water, and eight, eight frankfurter buns. Brown the beef and vegetable oil in heavy skillet over hot coals. Add frankfurters, tomato sauce, onion, and water. Cook about 15 minutes. Meanwhile, heat buns wrapped in foil. Serve hot mixture on heated buns. So it's brown the beef in the vegetable oil, then add the, so it's literally just loose ground beef with half a hot dog, or hot dogs that have been cut in half and a few other ingredients cooked together and then served on a hot dog bun. Almost like a chili dog, yeah. Interesting. Uh, I just, I find it just really interesting that they've decided that hot dogs are for kids, hamburgers are for adults, and so the burger dog was for teens. Uh, and, and they've marketed it that way the whole time, except except way back when, uh, in one of the James Beard books, where he made a point of saying that hot dogs are not just for kids, and there are a lot of sophisticated things you can do with them. Uh, <laughs> Frankfurters, the secret of succulent hot dogs is slow heating. One of the hardest lessons to teach junior cooks whose eager appetites make the necessary minimum of five minutes seem like an hour. Children and some adults love to toast their own frankfurters at the end of a stick over hot coals, a method that many times produces a hard, blackened frank with a tough, cold inside. If you are feeding, a more, if you are feeding more critical adults, better wrap the franks in flat packages of foil and let them steam. Tip. Place franks in wide mouth thermos jug. Fill with boiling water. Screw on cap. The franks will be ready to eat when you arrive at the picnic spot. <clears throat> I will have to read that one, Hannah. Uh, I had not seen that and that seems dubious. <clears throat> Popular Frankfurter variations, uh, Coney Islands, so Coney dogs, um, make Coney sauce, which is chili con carne, tomato paste, prepared mustard, and salt. Um, slit the Franks diagonally, which we've seen before. Grill over hot coals, split buns, butter, toast, spoon Coney sauce generally. Stuffed Franks. This is the, the recipe that Hannah pointed out as being somewhat dubious. Uh, split Frankfurters lengthwise, almost through. So cutting the hot dog so that it opens up the way that the bun would, still attached at the bottom, but slit down as though it was a bun in itself. Fill with cheese, a thin slice of dill pickle, or peanut butter. Wrap each spirally with a strip of bacon, fastening with a toothpick at each end, starting with split side down. Grill over hot coals until bacon is crisp. Serve in frankfurter rolls. So I can kind of see cheese working there. The pickle, a dill, dill pickle probably would work okay as well. Peanut butter seems weird in this application, but let's see hot dog, bacon, and peanut butter together. Without the bacon, it wouldn't make any sense. But flavor-wise, heated with the melty peanut butter, with the hot dog and the bacon together, it probably works. I've not had that combination together, <clears throat> but just thinking of those three different flavors and how they would mesh together, it probably works. But it is certainly something I had not seen before. Cheesy pups, barbecued bologna. 
And then we get into things like veal chops, grilled lamb chops, shish kebabs, pork, rumaki, oh, chicken liver appetizer, uh, game hens, whole barbecued turkey. So it was in the photograph and I said I wasn't sure. I had never seen in any of the books up to this point, except for the really early like 1890s, 1900s camping cookbooks that had recipes for absolutely everything and instructions on how to build your own fireplace out of stone, um, had not seen a recipe for a whole barbecued turkey. Here we are, 1961 Betty Crocker cookbook, whole barbecued turkey. Simplest way to entertain a large group of friends. Pictured on page 35, which we saw. Use a vented grill with closely fitting cover for that charcoal grilled flavor. Rub body cavity of 20 pound turkey with mixture of quarter cup salt and half teaspoon Tabasco. Rub neck cavity with mixture of two tablespoons salt and few drops Tabasco. Place two apples quartered and two onions quartered in body cavity. Fasten large opening with skewers and lace shut. Tie leg ends to tail. Fasten neck skin to back with skewers. So really similar to how you would prepare it for preparation in an oven. Um, lift wingtip up and over back for natural brace when turned over. Brush with unsalted fat or vegetable oil. Place bird in shallow pan and brown on both sides. Place cover over turkey, leaving vent open and adjust dampers. Cook 15 minutes per pound or about five hours, basting occasionally with tur turkey drippings. Let the bird rest in a warm place for 15 minutes before carving to make carving easier and retain juices in meat. So on the whole, you're still putting it in a roasting pan, the way that you would prepare it in your oven, in your kitchen. You're just doing it and putting that roasting pan into a charcoal grill instead, um, which I'm sure makes for a very lovely grilled, uh, like the charcoal flavor, just had not seen a recipe for that before. Hey, these fish look, the, that fish and that um, lobster look much happier than the one that was on the, the heraldry. Uh, scallop kebabs, shrimp and bruschetta, whole stuffed barbecued fish, steamed clams, dinner in a can. One, these are a section on one dish dinners and the illustration that is with it is um, people out camping. So not exactly backyard, but as we've seen over the course of this, it started with camping, cooking, and it's, it's outdoor cooking generally. Uh, a tasty dinner cooked in one pound coffee cans. Good for hobo parties or for out in the woods meals. That terminology is very interesting, hobo parties. Meat, carrots, tomatoes, corn, Bisquick dumplings. We have product placement with Bisquick. Um, I wonder, this was 1961. Was Bisquick a product of the Betty Crocker company at the time? I'm uncertain. I would have to investigate that. I would not be surprised given that it is a name brand listed in here. Uh, Season meat, divide into four patties, grease flour. Grease and flour, I assume is what that instruction is. Um, the coffee cans place the, a meat patty in the bottom of each can. And on top of the patty place three or four thin strips of carrot, three slices of tomato, and a quarter of the corn. Dot with butter, season with salt and pepper, cover securely, place on grill. Cook 20 to 30 minutes. Drop small spoonfuls of dumpling batter on each. Sprinkle with minced parsley or chives. Cover and cook 15 to 20 minutes. 
interesting. Yeah, and then it's gonna, we'll have um, actual like desserts and salads and other additional stuff. But since our focus is more on the grilling and more on the backyard grilling, I'm not gonna spend too much more time in this book because there are so many more to look at. Um, and like I said, this is the last week we're doing this topic, at least for now. So I don't want to spend the entire time in the 1960s. Um, in fact, let me pull out I think this is all of the 1960s left. Our next selection here is the by the caterer to the Lyndon B. Johnson Ranch, Walter Jetton's LBJ Barbecue Cookbook, written with Arthur Whitman. At least I assume LBJ is meaning Lyndon B. Johnson. Well, we'll find out. This is from 1965. It just says LBJ everywhere. And nowhere has it specifically said Lyndon B. Johnson, but I'd be surprised. Um, this one starts off with how barbecue started. So let's see what they say. I believe that barbecue started in Texas in the old cowboy days. In those days, which were a little before my own time, a man could have a ranch so large there wasn't any way he could set foot on every acre in a year. So what they do is send several cowboys out every spring to find the baby veals, count them, brand them, and sort them out. There were about a dozen cowboys on these roundups, and they were gone 40 or 50 days, maybe longer, depending on how far there was to go and how much there was to do. For eats and almost anything else the cowpokes needed, uh, a chuck wagon went along with them. There was no refrigeration in those days, so about the only way they could take meat along was in the form of jerky, which they learned how to make from the Indians. Jerky was strips of lean beef that had been hung out in the air and sun to cure. It would then keep pretty well and could be eaten four or five weeks later without too much of a toxic effect. It might kill you or me, but these cowpokes were mostly young and tough. To prepare jerky, which could only be made out of lean strips of, lean strips of meat, they had to slaughter a whole steer. The parts which were too fatty to be cured and made the best eating, were cooked right away. They took baling wire or whatever they had and tied the main body of this steer to a tree limb that stuck out of the oak or any other wood they had and cooked the steer right then and there. When it was ready, they made some fixins to go with it. Usually there might be a little pot of hard cider. And everybody came around and had themselves a nice hoorah before the boys went out. That hoorah is what they called the barbecue. In later years, barbecue got to be the name of the process of cooking over a wood fire so that the smoke penetrated the food and gave it a taste which is not to be had in any other way. It is my belief that this smoked cooked meat became a popular dish hereabouts because of action taken by the butchers, which was just the opposite of what the cowboys used to do. The butchers also had a whole steer which they cut up before they sold it to a housewife. They had only so many good cuts, sirloin steaks, T-bone steaks, roasts, and so forth. And then they came to the parts that are lean and stringy, like the neck and plate, belly, uh, and such other rough cuts. Since nobody makes jerky today, these parts don't sell very well. It is possible to make stew meat or hamburger, but you just can't sell everybody hamburger every day. <laughs> so to sell this meat, the modern barbecue came into being. Sorry. I just, <laughs> 1965, 
I'm a little suspect of his explanation of where barbecue came from. Um, he does present it as, as his own view. Uh, um, I'm, I'm not sure it would take a lot of research for me to, and, and some sources to back it up uh, for me to believe that that was the source of barbecue uh, or where it came from. But just the, um, this sentence, it's not possible, uh, or <coughs> you just can't sell everybody hamburger every day. Um, there are a lot of restaurant chains out there that would beg to differ with that sentiment today. <laughs> it reminds you of a chuck wagon cookbook that your mom has. Yeah. I could see that. So let's see what... Uh, let's see what kind of recipes are in here. We have a recipe for barbecue sauce. <laughs> this is the secret of the ages I'm giving you here, and I would not be surprised if wars have been fought over less. Use this as a plate or a table sauce with beef, chicken, pork, or almost anything else. Don't cook things in it. So tomato ketchup, cider vinegar, sugar, chili powder, salt, water, celery, bay leaves, garlic, chopped onion, butter, Worcestershire sauce, paprika, and black pepper. Seems like a pretty standard wet barbecue sauce makeup. Uh, and then they've got a dry rub or dry rib seasoning, dry poultry seasoning, and a mop for all barbecue meats. Use this to rub over meats or to baste them while they are cooking. Put it on with a little dish mop of the kind that you see in the dime store. As you use it, the flavor will change and improve, for you are constantly transferring smoke and grease from the meat back to the mop concoction. If you have any left over, keep it in the refrigerator. <clears throat> so salt, mustard, <clears throat> garlic powder, ground bay leaf, chili powder, paprika, Louisiana hot sauce, Worcestershire sauce, vinegar, bone stock, oil, MSG, or other pep powder. So a couple of new items there that have somewhat very specific uh, names. Oh, yes, indeed, Hannah. Um, Hannah was saying, I, I love that he specifies tomato ketchup because I learned recently that there are a lot of different types of ketchup. In fact, uh, tomato ketchup really didn't take off um, as like the overwhelming force to where most people today, when they think of ketchup, think of tomato ketchup. <clears throat> it wasn't until, I want to say World War One might have been World War II. No, I'm pretty sure it was World War One. Um, that tomato became the primary like ketchup, and it was because uh, the ingredients that ketchup usually was made from, uh, or the the most prominent ketchups on the market were made from, um, weren't as easy to get a hold of. So before then. Uh, it was more common to see mushroom ketchup or walnut ketchup. And as supplies of various things were impacted by war, um, tomato was able to take the place <coughs> and, and like they were still able to get tomatoes. So they were making ketchup out of tomatoes. I think they had been doing before that, but it just kind of took over the market and over time became the more dominant one. That is the story as I understand it. Um, I have not done research myself to independently verify it, so take it with a grain of salt. But that is the, the, the story as I have, have been informed. But yes, um, 
So my understanding was that mushroom and walnut ketchups were much more prevalent uh, prior to the World Wars. Um, and then tomato ketchup kind of took over the market. I've definitely seen in restaurants, um, I've seen blueberry ketchup, I know for sure. Uh, so ketchup refers to a process of like a, a specific formulation of that has to do with the, the combination of the vinegar and the salt and other ingredients together. Um, <clears throat> but you can start with a variety of different things as the base for that. And so that's why if you go to the grocery store, even today, a lot of the brands will still say tomato ketchup on them. <laughs> yes, take that info with a grain of tomato uh, because I don't have sources that I can cite to you. I don't remember. I want to say it was probably a Food Network program that I was watching a number of years ago. Um, I was unaware of other ketchups uh, before... I think we went to the newsroom, which was a restaurant in downtown Minneapolis, where they had uh, blueberry ketchup on their menu. And then I became curious, and I either watched something on the Food Network or did some research online and found an article that somebody had written about how walnut ketchup and mushroom ketchup had been the primary ketchups um, until some sort of supply line impact happened that caused tomatoes to kind of take over that market. Uh, you saw banana ketchup once. Yes, I've heard of banana ketchup. The blueberry ketchup um, did not taste like blueberry. It was very much still that like vinegary, acidic sauce rather than having like the sweetness of blueberry to it. Uh, there's a catch-up with Max and Jose episode where they taste a bunch of different catch-ups and Max talks a little about the history of ketchup. Cool. Yeah, and, and there are a number of things where what we think of as standard today was not always standard. So the Three Musketeers candy bar, uh, if you're in the U.S., you probably are familiar with the Three Musketeers candy bar. It's a chocolate shell over like a uh, chocolate nougat. Um, but it's called Three Musketeers because it used to be three different flavors. There used to be three small candy bars in the package. One was vanilla nougat, one was strawberry nougat, and one was chocolate nougat. But today it's just the chocolate. <laughs> oh, Max is in Max Miller from Tasting History. Cool. That is that is a very educational program. And um, if you're at all interested in kind of the stuff that we've been discussing on the program here with looking at these old cookbooks, um, I definitely would recommend Tasting History. Uh, he does a lot of research for those programs, and it really shows. <clears throat> so here, I think we're, we're starting to get, or this is maybe the, one of the first ones that we've seen where they have a slow, a slow barbecued brisket here. Um, kind of the, the southern definition of barbecue as opposed to like backyard grilling definition of barbecue, uh, which are definitely two different things. Awesome. Thanks, Hannah. I will check out that video later. Um, let's see. Pork chops, country fried steak, and beef heart barbecue, calf fries, balls, Texas hamburgers. Ball was a man who I believe made a fortune selling these hamburgers in Fort Worth. Like all good hamburgers, the secret was in the fixins, which are as follows. One medium-sized can of tomatoes drained, one tablespoon prepared horseradish. Mix these well, 
Grill a good sized hamburger patty on one side, turn and place two tablespoons of the mixture on, on the top while the other side cooks. Put them on a bun with a slice of pickle. So here, like this hamburger recipe doesn't even tell you how to prepare the meat at all. It doesn't tell you how to form your patties, how to cook your patties. <clears throat> it just tells you what toppings to put on it. So that's a different approach than what we've seen. Country fried chicken, deep fried chicken, wild pheasant, seafoods. concocted dishes, old settlers stew, goulash, Irish lamb stew, veal stew, shorty's chili con carne, hoxies, meat and potatoes, stuffed green peppers. There's a whole section here called Mexican dishes, where we get some tortillas, enchiladas, Texas tamales. Uh, this definitely has not been any in any of the other um, grilling books that we've seen uh, but this being one that is very specifically from Texas not surprising to see some Mexican uh, recipes in here huh Whoever owned this book in the past has noted that the end of the trail beans are good, but they've also renamed them picnic beans. Uh, this would be a dish that the chuck wagon cook fixed when he was getting near home again and had a little of this and a dab of that to use up. He didn't fix it just this way though. I'm giving you the easy way, but it is still a good eating dish. One can of lima beans drained, one can of kidney beans drained, one can of white navy beans drained, three onions chopped fine, one clove of garlic, three tablespoons bacon fat, a half a cup of ketchup, one tablespoon brown sugar, three tablespoons vinegar, one teaspoon salt, one teaspoon dry mustard, a quarter teaspoon of black pepper. Dump all the beans and other ingredients into a skillet or other pan. Mix well. Cover and place on the barbecue grill for one hour or so. Remove cover and cook another 15 minutes. Pretty easy making those. Wait. Subidobi, you, you don't know about goulash? I mean, there is definitely a dish called Hungarian goulash. Um, I don't know that goulash is exclusively Hungarian. Let, I'm going to find the, the goulash recipe here if I can. Where was it? Goulash. It's my belief that the German people brought this dish to Texas. It's a good eaten concoction. Restaurants will give you this with noodles. But I have found it's just as good or even better with rice. Um, so beef or veal, some suet, onions, garlic, water, ketchup, dry mustard, paprika, brown sugar, salt, Worcestershire sauce, uh, vinegar, and flour. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't give much of the history of it. But yeah, there's definitely... Um, Oh, you're surprised it's in the book because it's Hungarian. Um, yeah, apparently he says that he believes German people brought it to Texas as a dish. Again, a lot of the stuff in this book, he likes to preface it by saying, I believe such and such. Um, no actual like backup for why he believes that. Um, not even really saying this is a story I heard or something like that. It's just, I believe this, I believe that. So I'm not sure how much we can really trust the accuracy of th his assertions about uh, barbecue first developing in 
uh, with ranch hands. Um, German people bringing goulash to Texas. I don't know how much we can trust it. Apparently that's what he believed. <laughs> You're Hungarian and that's different than how you make it for sure. <laughs> oh, barbecued spiced bananas. I will go and find that one. Yeah, it'd be lovely if, if we could um, publish something and just say, I believe this without like saying, uh, here's all of the, the backup for why I believe this and why you should too. Um, but I guess if you're just writing a cookbook and telling stories, you can get away with it. Where was that banana? Coffee cakes and breads. Desserts. Got to be in desserts. Barbecued spiced bananas. Peel a banana or two for each person. Cut pieces of aluminum foil large enough to wrap the bananas in lay and lay the bananas on them. Brush with lemon juice and sprinkle with brown sugar. Dot with butter, throw in a dash of cinnamon or nutmeg if you feel like it. Wrap each banana in the foil separately and lay them on in the coals for five minutes. So probably less messy than the one than the recipe we saw in the Girl Scouts cookbook. Um, barbecued as in the method of cooking, not that they have like barbecue sauce on them, which is what I initially thought when I read the name. Uh, these are just like cinnamon, brown sugar, a nutmeg. Um, put it in some foil and cook it in the coals until it's warm, which probably tastes absolutely amazing. The variation that the Girl Scouts cookbook had was to split open the banana um, and put in essentially like chocolate chips alternating with marshmallows and then close it up again uh, and pin it with like toothpicks and cook that on the grill. Um, and I forgot what that was called, but <laughs> yeah, like this is not the first time, like I said, it's not the first time that w they, they've talked about some sort of grilled heated banana dish. And I honestly can say I've never really thought about eating hot bananas, hot spiced bananas as a dessert, but it sounds really good. Um, let's see what else we have. We've got one hour left and we're still firmly entrenched in the 1960s. Uh, this one is from 1966, Lazy Man's Cookout Guide. Uh, 40 pages of recipes and cooking tips for easy to serve outdoor meals. So I don't know whether they thought it was a good thing telling their potential customers that they are lazy. Like, is that supposed to... People don't like to think of themselves as lazy. So is that a good marketing strategy to say, who knows? Uh, it's very small. <laughs> if you're a guy who thinks he'd like to cook and knows for sure he likes to eat, here's the book for you. A guy who thinks he'd like to cook but knows you like to eat. <laughs> yeah, they do stuff like that with plantains all the time, so why not bananas? Ooh, one second. Uh, these easy-to-do recipes have been prepared and tested by the Creative Recipe Institute for the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company and are calculated to please your wife, who can get out of the kitchen for one meal, make you a hero to the kids, who didn't know daddy could cook too, and absolutely amaze all your friends, who'll ask for seconds. You can't exactly produce these dishes while lying out in the hammock, or even with one hand tied behind your back, but they require very little effort to prepare, 
All you need are the most basic ingredients, the simplest of tools, and a really hearty appetite. Uh, I will just note, this was published in 1966 by the R.J. Reynolds Tobacco Company um, and is in no way an, endorse an endorsement of smoking. Uh, at least on my behalf, this is a historical document. It is something in our collections. Um, smoking is not good for you. So uh, you may see advertisements in this book for cigarettes, and this is not an endorsement of those. Um, please don't smoke. <laughs> yes, Lord Portico. <laughs> Your mom's chuck wagon cookbook is from Marlboro. Yeah. Uh, these are items you will find useful for outdoor cooking. Provide yourself with as many as you think you'll need, depending on the recipe you're using and how elaborate you want the meal to be. Outdoor grill, uh, starter package of charcoal, hickory chips, electric starter, water spray bottle, hinge broiler, asbestos gloves, again. Uh, the others are fairly standard. I just had to mention the asbestos gloves. Um, and even dozen ways to make barbecuing easy. Let's see what we got. Vesuvius. Your taste buds erupt. Half a pound of hot Italian sausage and a half a pound of sweet Italian sausage. Cut sausages into bite-sized pieces. Thread sweet and hot si sausages alternately on skewers and grill over hot coals until well done. Serves four. Saucy onions. Happy meatballs. Which the illustration for the happy meatballs is kind of funny. Those are gi ginormous. They're as big as those people's heads. Um, what's interesting... The recipe and instructions for these meatballs. You want two eight ounce packages of frozen meatballs, salt and pepper, a tablespoon of cooking oil, 10 ounce bottle of chili sauce, eight ounce jar of grape jelly, and toothpicks for spearing. Defrost those meatballs, season with salt and pepper, and brown well in hot oil. Combine chili sauce and jelly in a pot on the grill and add the meatballs. Simmer for 15 minutes. So they really are um, trying to give recipes for people who are not inclined to cook, taking advantage of what would have been fairly... Uh, like, you don't see this in cookbooks. They never tell you to use frozen meatballs in cookbooks at this time. Even today, cookbooks don't tell you to use frozen ingredients. So this, the fact they're giving you a recipe that says, go find some frozen meatballs, defrost them, cook them in some oil, and put this sauce on them. It, it, I guess it lives up to its name as the Lazy Man's book. <laughs> Lazy Man's Cookout Guide. Foiled fish. We got two-tone steak. We've got lazy burgers. Easy and pleasing. Uh, ground steak. So that's different. It's not ground chuck. Uh, onion juice. Chopped pimento olives. Salt, pepper, chili sauce. And one whole cocktail olive per burger. Mix... Well, all the ingredients except the whole olives. Form round burgers, inserting whole olive in center of each. Um, sorry, I think maybe I was not moving around enough and the lights decided to shut off. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> but they came back. So grill over hot coals about 10 minutes, serves six. We've been doing this for seven months now, and that's the first time that that has happened with the lights. They do, they, and um, Lord Portico, the, the recipes that you see on the side of soup cans that these are similar to also generally were put out in the 60s. The soup can recipes or the recipe that you'll find on the 
box of Nilla wafers or the recipe that you find on the like side of a Hormel chili can or the recipe that you find on um, uh, oh I had another anyway those kinds of recipes that you see on the labels of the packaged foods that you're buying most of those were originally developed in the 60s. They may have been modified since then. Oh, I was thinking of um, canned fruit for pies, where you get like pie recipes. Um, most of those recipes were originally developed in the 60s. Um, and oftentimes they were developed partly as a way to help sell the new products too. So if, my favorite um, one to kind of cite is if you've ever heard of Watergate salad, um, it's a dessert item that's made with marshmallows and Cool Whip and pistachio pudding and um, it was originally developed by Jell-O to help sell their pistachio pudding flavor when they first released pistachio as a flavor. And it was called Watergate Salad, not because it had anything to do with the Watergate Hotel, but because that name was bound to make people interested in it and help drive those sales. <laughs> Another recipe with peanut butter, Hudson Bay bacon. So again, peanut butter and bacon are not a combination I've had before, but it's one that makes sense flavor-wise. Um, this time it's Canadian bacon, uh, but it should still work. 12 slices of Canadian bacon, two cups of soft bread crumbs, half a cup of raisins, quarter cup of peanut butter, quarter cup of Br'er Rabbit molasses. So another name brand. Uh, We've got a couple of, of name brand items in here. Uh, we've got dry mustard, melted butter. It's interesting because this is from the RJ Reynolds company, which I don't think owned Br'er Rabbit. Uh, Br'er Rabbit molasses is still around today. This one here, we've got Vermont made green label syrup. Um, so there's a couple of name brands in here. Frantic Franks for last minute snacks. 12 Frankfurters, 12 Frankfurter rolls. It's interesting, all of the cookbooks refer to them as Frankfurters. None of them are calling them hot dogs. Occasionally one will have the word hot dog in the description, but they're always being labeled as Frankfurters in the books. Yeah, I think I have a jar, or a, I think I have a container of Br'er Rabbit at home. Yes, the Texas one called them wieners, but uh, they're not calling them hot dogs. Grill the Franks over hot coals on long-handled forks. Blend the butter and herbs and spread on each split roll. Toast the rolls lightly. When Franks are done, serve on hot herbed rolls. Lobster. Buttermelt smelt. <laughs> Basted bass. Just right shrimp. Angler's delight. All right, I don't want to spend too much time on this book. Let's move on to the next one. Uh, and yeah, the back of it is Definitely a cigarette ad that I'm just not going to show because I don't have to. But interestingly enough, the whole book, recipes, the only place there was actually a cigarette ad in that recipe book put out by a cigarette company was on the back cover. Here we have one that I'm guessing was rebound uh, to put it in a library binding, um, just based on the fact that there's nothing on the outside. We have camp cookery for small groups. Um, this looks very similar to the some of the um, 
camping cookbooks from like the 1900s. Uh, this is from 1967, and it is inscribed to the VPI Library, which VPI, Virginia Polytechnic Institute, so Virginia Tech. Um, it was inscribed to the library by the author, Arthur Walrath. Um, and this was published in Blacksburg, Virginia here, so I'm guessing he was probably faculty here. Uh, you would have to look at the Marlboro Chuck Wagon book again, but you don't remember cigarette ads in it. Yeah, um, I definitely, honestly, I've seen more cigarette ads in Playbills than, like, th this was very specifically a cookbook, and they kept it to that purpose, which I won't say lots of positive things about cigarette companies. They, they were not the greatest uh, companies. Um, but they managed to refrain from selling their product in the cookbook that they put out. I'll give them that. Um, let's see. So this, honestly, it may not be a rebind. This seems like a limited publication. Um, it has kind of a not mass market feel to it. Um, and considering that it was published here in Blacksburg and there is no publisher here in Blacksburg uh, and definitely wasn't at that time. I, technically there is one here, but the actual production of stuff um, doesn't happen here. Uh, this seems like small batch publishing to me. Um, and this is definitely a camping-related book again. He was the mayor of Blacksburg. That does not preclude him being a faculty, or, faculty here at Tech. <laughs> uh, but um, that is uh, interesting to know. there are quite a few people that work at tech that are also like on city council and, and things like that. Um, Blacksburg itself is rather small. Uh, let's see, we've got roast chicken, fried chicken, beef stew. I'm flipping through it kind of quickly because uh, not, not that it's not interesting, it's just by this point, we've basically moved past camping cookbooks um, and we're more focused on the ones that are particularly looking at backyard grilling, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but um, interestingly enough, here's a recipe for goulash. Uh, ingredients, shortening, baked beans, onions, Vienna sausage, and crushed pineapple. That does not sound like goulash to me. <laughs> put frying put frying pan with about a tablespoon of shortening in it on coals to heat put beans in kettle and put over some coals that are past their prime remove the outer layers and ends from the onions and dice into small pieces when frying pan is hot put onions in and brown thoroughly after onions are browned add them to the beans open Vienna sausages add pineapple that's beanie weenies. That's not goulash. <laughs> Wait, there are illustrations? Nancy Runyon's. Yeah, pineapple? Th this is beanie weenies, which I think is actually a brand name, but it's like Kleenex is a brand name, where like baked beans with hot dogs in. This is just baked beans with Vienna sausages and pineapple added. So slightly sweet baked beans with frankfurters inside of it. This is not goulash. Why is it called Maynard's goulash? <laughs> oh no. Mubat, what? 
What was wrong? I don't understand. I'm sorry, Subby Doby. I don't know what you did. I'm gonna, I wanna see what. Oh, I, you, it was probably, you just had too many O's in your no. <laughs> and, and Mubot was like, nope, too much. <laughs> so, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> we have another goulash, Ernie's goulash, which is hamburger, onion, soup, vegetables, and salt and pepper. Still not exactly a goulash. <laughs> and knowing is half the frankfurter. Um, it's really hard to, to kind of set the, um, the bot settings so that it catches things that you want it to catch and doesn't catch doesn't occasionally catch things that are fine. Um, I, it probably it's got a setting somewhere in it that says too many of the same letter in a row, uh, and it's probably one of the default settings. So, no worries. <laughs> chuck wagon cooking from Marlboro Country range recipes and chuck wagon history. Published in 1981 by Philip Morris Incorporated, smoking company. Not a single cigarette ad in the entire book. Not even a picture of someone with a cigarette in the book. So, yeah, amazing. Uh, still not going to say they're good companies, but apparently they were able to publish uh, cookbooks without pushing their product. Here we have outdoor cooking at the BOSES Environmental Education Center at Brookville. Board of Cooperative Educational Services of Nassau County, Division of General Services, Office of Outdoor and Environmental Education. Interesting. I don't know. This is just real, like, it's stapled together with one staple. The outdoor cooking program. This is from 1967. So the language in here, talking about American Indians. Um, American Indians being excellent farmers were the first to cultivate what compromises 50% of today's world plant foods. Among the crops which the Indians cultivated were Indian corn, beans, peanuts, apples, tomatoes, squash, and pumpkin. The homesteaders learned to grow and use these same crops. Um, participation in the outdoor cooking program at the Outdoor and, and Environmental Education Center at Brookville will provide students an opportunity to use ingredients and techniques which are familiar to those used by homesteaders. I think it's a brochure, like a classroom handout or a like a guide for an educational program uh, from 1967. There's some materials and utensils for what you're going to prepare in advance before going on the trip and then what you're going to prepare actually out in nature. So interesting. They've got Johnny Cakes, Hasty Pudding, which is hot cornmeal cereal, uh, sourdough biscuits, applesauce, and that's it. That's all that they're, they're preparing. Um, there is a, an illustration of a female presenting person on the front, so I'm assuming that this was a program intended for Young girls, uh, Nassau County, it doesn't tell me for sure what state, um, I believe, let's see, I would assume New York, 
so this Nassau County would be Long Island. Um, I don't know that there is another Nassau County. Nope, there's a Nassau County, Florida as well, but still my guess would be New York and that this program was on Long Island. <laughs> So, interesting. I pulled these things from the Rare Books collection based on topic and call number more so than by like investigating each one. Because as you know, for this program, most of the time, I'm encountering these things for the first time at the same time as you are. Uh, here we have Betty Crocker's new outdoor cookbook, Barbecues. It was apparently $2.95, according to the little sticker. Um, it's bigger than the Betty Crocker book that we looked at before. And this one is from 1967. Ooh. Still starting with how to make the fire. I'm not going to spend too much time. We looked at a... Betty Crocker book already. So let's look at the table of contents and see if there's anything we feel we need to see in this book. Um, it, even without seeing the Betty Crocker name, yes, it definitely has that Betty Crocker look. Uh, so again, as with the other one, basics of barbecuing, barbecue favorites, on-the-go cooking. So this is this is literally just an updated version of the Betty Crocker book that we looked at earlier. Only the book got bigger. <laughs> like physically, physical dimension wise, the book got larger. Um, from the same year, we also have Betty Crocker's new outdoor cookbook. So the red one is new outdoor cookbook barbecues, and the green one is just the new outdoor cookbook. Um, but basically the same. Uh, apparently this one has, huh, somebody has left a page in here that they took from the Better Homes and Gardens magazine, May 1978. Uh, I can tell because at the bottom, this is page 97 of Better Homes and Gardens, May 1978, uh, where somebody has inserted the recipe for Peloponnesian pot roast into the front of this cookbook. The green one does look less like a, like a Betty Crocker cookbook, although the table of contents is the same as far as topics. Um, the, the book itself feels very Betty Crocker, but the, um, it l doesn't look the same. But it's, it's got the metal, um, yeah, the, the cover, it, it feels like a Betty Crocker product. But this one, even if I cut the, the title off the top, or cut the Betty Crocker name off the top, um, this one's got the font and the color, like it, it looks like even their modern cookbooks from today. Um, let's see. Got a few more to get to. We're going to skip that one. Favorite recipes from Southern Kitchens, Outdoor Cooking. The complete book of outdoor cooking. When is this from? 1970. And boy, does it look like it's from 1970. Look at that font and that orange color. That is 1970 design. <laughs> It's just subtly different from the 1960s design, and, and, yeah. Um, 
baskets full of avocados. Pickled okra appetizer. Crab dip, cottage cheese, apples, rosé. We've got lots of patio beverages. Sparkling backyard refreshments from bubbling sodas to frosty fruit coolers. Spicy hot beverages. Soda magic with soft drinks. Fresh air salads. Let's see. I didn't see a table of contents in this book. I'm going to look in the... I want to see what they've got for hamburgers. Uh, if anything. Beef. Grilled hamburger steak. Because that is where I would look. Like, that's how I would look up hamburgers. Grilled hamburger steak. Prepared mustard, chili powder, soft butter, ground beef check. Green onions with tops. Chili sauce, Worcestershire. French bread. Thin cucumber sli half slices. Small tomato half slices. So, trying to elevate that burger. Um, still got that Worcestershire sauce, though. Interesting. I didn't see if they had hot dogs. Yeah, the photos are very 1970s. Blueberry Crips. Just going to look for Frankfurters, given how they seem to want to upscale everything. Nope. Interesting. Uh, they, they've gone upscale in their descriptions of things, but they call them hot dogs instead of frankfurters. Interestingly enough, the frankfurters, uh, which are listed in the ingredients, like the recipe is called hot dogs roasted on sticks. Um, the ingredients list calls them frankfurters. They are in a section called a special picnic just for children. So definitely still treating hot dogs as something just for kids. And it just lists the ingredients as frankfurters. Doesn't give any suggestions on toppings or anything else. Just Hot dogs on buns, you're done. The disrespect for the simple hot dog. Um, let's see, we have Gourmet International Barbecue Cookbook, The Fine Art of Outdoor Cooking. Uh, this one was out in storage and I had to request it from storage. It's from 1972. Fine heart of outdoor cooking. Put some more flavor in your life. Again, very 70s. Just the, the changeover from the 60s to the 70s in graphical style is so abrupt. Drip pans. This one has a lot of illustrations of stuff. The other one didn't. But the other one had photographs and this one, I don't know. Oh, check for doneness. You've got rare, medium, rare, medium and well done all illustrated there. That's nice. Beef steak burgers. Lean beef chuck, round sirloin tip or hamburger meat, finely chopped onion, 
egg, Worcestershire sauce, salt, pepper, butter or margarine. They don't have breadcrumbs. Penny Saver Burgers. Change the mixture as follows. Reduce the meat to one and a, quarter, one and a half pounds. Add a half a cup of cook, uncooked rolled oats and a third of a cup of tomato juice or milk. Look at this. This entire two-page spread. Yeah, and they, they were smoking in those photos. It was very 70s photos. This entire spread is variations on the hamburger. Bacon burgers, cheeseburgers, blue cheeseburgers, cheesy tomato burgers, Copenhagen burgers, uh, dilly burgers, Fancy Frenchy Burgers, German Hamburgers, Island Burgers, Mexicana Burgers, uh, Naples Burgers, Olive Burgers, New York Burgers, Peanut Butter Burgers, again with the peanut butter, Pepper Burgers, Prickly Cheese Burgers, Pizza Burgers, Pocket Burgers, Russian Burgers, Southwest Burgers, Tater Burgers, and Two High Burgers. Uh, peanut Butter Burgers sound really weird here. Reduce salt to a third of a, uh, one, and one, one and three quarters teaspoons. Add a half a teaspoon of dill weed and a half a cup of finely chopped salted peanuts before mixing. Shape into a six or eight patties. Top each hot burger with one tablespoon of peanut butter and one or two thin dill pickle slices. Okay, so not as weird as I was thinking because I've definitely had a peanut butter and pickle sandwich before and it was not horrible. But yeah. Island Burger has pineapple. Um, one of the best burgers I ever had uh, was from a burger joint um, that was just, just called The Burger Place in Minneapolis. Um, and I used to go there and I, I used to get a turkey burger because I like turkey patties uh, on my burgers. Um, but it was teriyaki sauce and pineapple on top of the burger. And it was really good. <laughs> There's a restaurant near you that has peanut butter burgers on their menu and apparently they're really good but you haven't had them. Might be worth trying. I definitely, it, when I started reading this recipe, I was like, dill weed and peanut butter. And then it got, it mentioned dill pickles. And I was like, wait, I've had a peanut butter and pickle sandwich. It was no more strange than a peanut butter and cheese sandwich, which I've also had. Um, and they were okay. They made sense. They're just not a typical combination. Um, you hope that it comes with a tiny umbrella. Yeah, teriyaki and pineapple on a on a burger. Um, it's messy <laughs> because the teriyaki sauce just like drips out and gets all over everything, but it is delicious. Uh, poultry. Turkeys for barbecuing. Breads, desserts, kebabs, salads, sauces. I didn't see hot dogs anywhere. I don't see frankfurters. Sausage. Let's check there. 34 and 54. Oh. <laughs> We did see this. Yes, this is where hot dogs are. They're under sausage in this book. Um, and we have a, a variety. It's not just, it's not relegated to just for kids like in the last book. There's a sausage to please most every taste. Many of the favorites are now available fully cooked and need only a quick heating or, and browning. Read the package labels carefully. 
All sausages not labeled fully cooked or ready to eat must be pre-cooked before grilling or cooked very slowly until thoroughly done. Uh, but you've got Frank's, Wiener's, Smoky Link's, Ring Bologna, and Knockwurst, Bratwurst, Pork Sausage Link's, uh, Four Ways to Grill Them, More Sausage Treats, Crispy Hot Dog Sandwich, Giant Hot Dog Sandwich, Aloha Sausage Sandwiches, um, Mexicana Frank's, Hawaki Hot Dogs, Berliner, Fra uh, Berliner Franks, Smoky Franks, Franks American Style. So actually finally getting some respect for hot dogs with a number of different preparations. We saw that in the James Beard where he had 14 different ways to prepare your hot dogs. Um, and here, after a much, much disrespect to the humble hot dog, we have eight recipes or eight different ways to prepare and top them. They're not the typical ones that we would see like a Coney dog or a Chicago dog or like what we would look for as different um, ways to serve hot dogs today, but there's a variety there. Uh, here we have a book called Chuck Wagon Cookin. Uh, this is a full on book from the University of Arizona Press in Tucson, Arizona, written by Stella Hughes and illustrated by the author. And this is from 1974 originally, but this is the seventh printing from 1997. So, not exactly the style of cooking that we were looking for. And this is uh, more of a narrative book than a recipe book. So don't have time really to dive into this one right now. Um, gonna keep going because <laughs> we only have a limited time on this program. Uh, let's see, this one is a paperback like the size of like a paperback novel. This, that standard like paperback size. Um, also 1974 called Roughing It Easy. It says the national bestseller. Is this a novel? It takes an outdoor woman from Utah to write a complete primer on making do outdoors. It puts the commonplace into unthought of uses. A great cookbook. So it is a cookbook. It does not look like a cookbook. It looks like a novel. <laughs> oh, it has aged. Look at the color. Uh, going to be gentle with it because as paper book, uh, paperbacks age, um, they don't age as well as some other publications. Uh, they're more akin to like pulp books or pulp uh, magazines. Um, a lot of times the pages can get brittle and dry. Uh, copyright 1974, introduction, planning, campsite, fire building, methods of cooking, recipes, color plates, sourdough, and first aid. Interesting contents. Uh, this seems like it's going to be more of a cooking or a camping book. Forward, introduction, planning. Let me see. Oh. Interesting. Little bookmark somebody had in there. It's got some color plates, bacon and eggs. So this is not an uncommon thing either. Um, it costs a lot of money to do glossy color pages like this. Um, 
so they paid for some, um, and they're just all grouped together. Let me see what the index has to, to give us in this book. It's definitely a camping book, which may actually um, be part of the reason it is in this form factor, this like paperback size, because it would be easier to pack inside of a knapsack or um, a hiking bag uh, with this smaller form. And this would have been a standard printing size, so it would have been cheaper to produce at this size than doing something that's truly pocket size. Um, hamburger, 172. Frankabobs, 170. So we'll take a glance, a, a glance at those, 170 and 172, and then we will uh, Move on because I still want to go through a couple more things later on. Frankabobs. Method stick, time five to ten minutes. Um, actually, there's a couple here the Bako dogs as well. So two different preparations of hot dogs there. And then we've got a basic hamburger mix, which is hamburger, egg, salt, pepper, onion, other spices as desired. Bread or crackers may be added with some milk. Interesting. This is the first one we've seen that looked like a novel. Uh, we have the Culinary Arts Institute, the Outdoor Cookbook. So yes, this publication is by the CIA. Um, the Culinary Arts Institute. Which gets mentioned as the CIA all too often. It's very confusing. 1975, whoops. It's slightly too big for my camera. Fish bake chowder beach party. <clears throat> Gotta love the chowders. Backpack meals. Oh, they've got some lovely illustrations in here. Still very clearly 1970s from these illustrations. Hamburger cups. Tomato sauce, brown sugar, dry sherry or vinegar, Worcestershire sauce, prepared mustard, salt, uh, one egg slightly beaten, crumbs from flavored crackers, lean ground beef, dairy, uh, sour cream, blue cheese, green onions. Combine, toss lightly into six patties, grill. Using back of spoon, form a hollow in each patty. Turn patties and, turn patties and grill another 10 minutes. Arrange patties hollow side up on a heated platter and fill with the sour cream. Sprinkle with blue cheese and green onion. Spoon buttered mushrooms onto platter. Garnish with parsley. So not serving them on a bun, literally making a little bowl out of the hamburger and serving it with cheese inside of it. Interesting. Wham burgers. I, I have to read it because it's got the name Wham Burgers. Blend bottled barbecue sauce with lightly seasoned ground beef. Shape into patties. Place on the grill about five inches from coals. Grill on one side, turn, 
spoon additional barbecue sauce over patties and grill until done. Serve on hot toasted buttered buns with additional heated barbecue sauce and assorted relishes. They're literally just ground beef mixed with barbecue sauce, turned into a patty, grilled with additional barbecue sauce added. That's it. Interesting. Where'd my lights go? There they are. I don't understand. It's twice today, and it's never done that before. Um, all right. I'm just going to show off a couple of these. We may dive into some of them, but we are 15 minutes out from the end of our time, and I want to show a couple of the newer things. Um, here we have Elegant Fair from the Weber Kettle. So Weber uh, manufactures these grills, which if you're in the US, you've probably seen one of these kettle grills before. Um, everybody growing up in the 80s, their parents had one of these grills. Uh, <laughs> it's a very common thing. Um, the book itself, the binding of it, is very reminiscent of those Betty Crocker books. Um, beef, pork, lamb, poultry, seafood, sauces, wok cooking, hors d'oeuvres, vegetables, cooking charts, and cards. Um, 1978 is when this is from. <laughs> yeah, I, do, I don't know what's going on with my lighting today. Uh, we got the sound working and now suddenly the lights aren't working for the first time ever. Um, beef bird casseroles, stuffed peppers and onions, stuffed bacon boucha burgers, Mexican burgers, Chinese burgers, uh, cheeseburgers, pineapple pork kebabs. I get wary whenever I see something labeled as Chinese um, that's from the 60s or 70s because it's most likely going to be very stereotypical and not respectful. Um, let's see. Fire and Smoke, Worldwide Charcoal Cookery. Uh, I'm just going to kind of glance at some of these, see what we've got. Illustrations of cavemen. Eskimo fish on a stick with wild blueberries. Alaskan split log grill. Angie's polenta. All American clam bake. Interesting combination of things there. Let's see. So North America, then Latin America, the Caribbean, France, British Isles, Hungary and Finland, Italy, Spain and Portugal, Middle East, Africa, China, Japan, India and Pakistan. So they've got things divided into relatively er, uh, in, into geographic regions. Where was I lost it. I was looking for Hungary again. Ah, here we go. Hungary and Finland listed together. Uh, Tiroler Kals, Kalbs labor Paprikas, a skewer of bacon, sausages, and liver, Rablohus of the Zardanas, robber's meat on trestles of fried bread, Heki's sausage in a sauna, Pekena Husa Se Zelim, a crackling crisp goose stuffed with sauerkraut. Linguistically similar but you wouldn't have thought there was much culinary overlap. Interesting. Uh, 
the uh, Tsardas or peasant inns were once the hostels for Hungarian cowboys and highwaymen. Today, the food is still simple, usually cooked outdoors in a traditional white kiln or over the open fire. The Hungarians cut thick slabs of bacon in coxcomb curls and roast them over the fire for open-faced sandwiches or as the central piece in a mixed grill. Along with wonderful bacon and sausage, the Hungarian goose liver appears on the Epicurean tables of the world and is roasted whole in its own fat over the coals. <laughs> Absolutely, Uh So it, Hannah's been in chat many times, and so if I see something related to Iowa, I will mention it because I know that Hannah's out there. Uh, no cowboys in Hungary, though. <laughs> uh, yeah, I believe you. This was, again, a publication of... It's an American publication from 1978, so... Their ideas about the world and how they present them, not always accurate. Uh, Heinz and Genstekerth barbecue and the joy of cooking on an open fire. Uh, so now we're getting into the point where they're pontificating about fire, food, and civilization at the beginning of these barbecue books. Um, and then they talk about types of barbecue, choosing barbecue, how to build them, etc. Not going to go too far into that one. Um, I want to save this one for last. We have a barbecue book from Reynolds Wrap, the people who make um, like aluminum foil. Uh, this is from 1982. Reynolds Wrap put out a barbecue cookbook. Get out them high quality historians, yeah. A man has been cooking meat since the beginning of time. You know, um, I do believe that was this cookbook. It's the one that started with the illustrations of cavemen. <laughs> uh, family resources cookout, no. Um, we have another from the Weber Grill Makers. The, Another cookbook from them. We have one from Sears. So starting to get name brands putting out specifically grill cookbooks. Um, uh, let's see. Do, 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 do. I'm just going to do some really quick summarizing, and then I have a fun one to end with. Um, it's camping again. Woo! <laughs> Hi, Kira. Uh, here's another name brand that is heavily associated with outdoor grilling that put out a recipe book, um, Kingsford. Uh, in the U.S., Kingsford, I think, is almost exclusively known for charcoal briquettes that you use in charcoal barbecues. Uh, like, that is the product they sell, is the charcoal that you use to do barbecuing in your backyard. Um, this costs $2.95 in 1988, and they have a um, yeah, a cookbook. Their, their acknowledgments in the front are the Alaska Seafood Marketing Institute, Salmon Division, Beef Industry Council, National Broiler Council, National Livestock and Meat Board, Norseland Foods, and Weber Grills. And this book was manufactured in Yugoslavia. Yeah, I think they probably sell lighter fluid as well. Um, but yeah, so we've got, they put out 
their own cookbook as well. Um, and then when we get to the, let's see. So that was 80s. I don't know if we have anything from the 90s. Because then we go to this 2002 book called Dressed to Grill. No product placement. None at all. Um, so this is what a modern version of these books looks like. This is from 2002. Still kind of the same, though, as far as like topics covered. Introduction. Um, this one is very specifically, hey, girlfriend, uh, <laughs> dressed to grill. It, it's, this is actually aimed at a female market instead of um, a men's market, which a lot of grill books are aimed at the men's market. Uh, and then we have another chuck wagon one with a foreword by Tommy Lee Jones. Um, just running out of time. We have one that's specifically called Tech Tailgates, uh, which is a Virginia Tech uh, book of recipes to be used for sports tailgating. Um, we've got one called Smoke in the Mountains, uh, which is about the art of Appalachian barbecue that is from 2004. Uh, this one is, again, from Weber Grills, a salute to steak. It is a military-themed one. Um, <laughs> According to their website, Kingsford is a brand of charcoal briquette used for grilling, along with related products. Yeah. Um, and then... Then you get these explorations of the topic in depth. This is from 2016. It's called Virginia Barbecue, A History. And it is uh, a full on like research work about the history of barbecue. This being like the slow cooked pork barbecue that is like the southern meaning of barbecue. Um, so full on researched works. Uh, again, here's one called Barbecue by Shelton, John Shelton Reed that is from 2016. So we went from like camping books that people would take with them uh, to go camping to just cookbooks to these fully researched, very elegant books, but also cookbooks. Uh, Kingsford is owned by the Clorox company. That's interesting. But the one that I wanted to end with, and we'll have a couple of minutes to look at, just because it's fun, this is from 1981. It is the Jim Henson's Muppet Picnic Cookbook. <laughs> so, like, I could end on anything, but we've been looking at these for a month. We started in 1890s. We glanced at stuff from the 2016s. 1981, the Jim Henson's Muppet Picnic Cookbook. We have Kermit the Frog. I'm not going to try and do the voice. I, I'm not sure I can read it without trying to do the voice. Hi ho, Kermit the Frog here. Organizer, Mater D, and Spokes Frog for the incredible Once in a Lifetime Muppets Picnic Cookbook. I'm not great at Kermit's voice. I haven't practiced much. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, <laughs> we're all really thrilled to have been asked to share our favorite recipes with you. Some of them are, well, let's just say some of them are unique, but they've all been fully tested by Muppet Labs, which I'm sure gives you oodles of confidence. We had a blink. I think we're back. You're actually watching from the campus of Jim Henson's alma mater. <laughs> um, of course, Miss Piggy has seen fit to bend the rules just a teensy bit. She cheated and has given us her caterer's favorite recipes. My own personal choice is swamp salad, which brings back memories of when I was just a wee tad growing up among the lily pads. 
swamp salad, uh, bib, romaine, and leaf lettuce, fresh spinach, fresh mushrooms, small red onion, and then some dressing that's mayonnaise, garlic, lemon juice, Parmesan cheese, milk, and salt and pepper. And I just love the full illustration. They've got the finished salad. They've got most of the ingredients sitting out there. Um, Kira, what, or, or Key Squared, which, uh, which school? I don't know which school Jim Henson went to. Um, University of Maryland. Okay. And we get Miss Piggy, Precious Pink Punch, and Watermelon Dream Boat. There's a statue on campus. That's cool. Look at this Watermelon Dream Boat. It's literally a watermelon that's been carved out, and there are melon balls put in for various different kinds of melon. There were a lot of spiral-bound, self-published cookbooks in the 2000s. Organizations used them as fundraisers, collecting recipes for members, printing and binding them themselves. It was popular to get Grandma's recipe printed with her name in the credits. <laughs> yeah, I believe that was not worth it. I actually have a family cookbook um, that was used to be sold at the antique stores in the town where my parents grew up um, that was entirely self-published like literally my grandmother printed it on her printer at home and stapled it together and used to sell them in the the antique store where she worked um that would have been in the probably late 90s or early 2000s um and i've definitely we we have some of those like lower or more regional or unique uh, single printing books as well. The Virginia Tech one with the spiral bound? Yeah, uh, probably. Um, Fozzie Bear, we've got corn relish, corn on the cob, corn pudding, onion corn on the cob. Apparently Fozzie likes corn. The Great Gonzo has barbecued ice cream and Muppet Labs vanilla ice cream. I, I have to read the barbecue ice cream recipe for you. A word of warning, however, this is a daring and possibly dangerous recipe and should only be attempted by a highly trained professional like me. You ordinary humans should not attempt to prepare this at home. First, I make the ice cream. Recipe follows. Vanilla works best, because you never know when chocolate is done. Then I put four scoops of ice cream on a skewer. Now here comes the tricky part. You gotta be quick and talented. Put the skewer on the grill without dropping any of the, oops. Then I quickly fill another skewer and another. While they're cooking, I set fire to the strawberries and turn the skewers over. Yipes, they're not supposed to melt. If I can just get this gooey stuff off, oh no. I can't understand it. They baked Alaska. Why didn't this work? So barbecued ice cream, not an actual recipe, but they do give you a recipe for making vanilla ice cream. <laughs> oh dear. Oh, Key Squared, you just finished your University of Maryland MLIS. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to the world of having a library science degree. Uh, the Swedish chef, barbecued filet of sole, barbecue and der steak marinade, and Swedish chef's Italian buttered bread. Oh, I have to, it's, it is. Barbecued filet of sole. Your rinse and der sneakers and, de, and pat and dry Brushen der Schnecker with salad oil und season with salt and pepper. Putten der Schnecker on der grill, low flamen, und broil slowly, turning often for 35 to 45 minuten. 
combine their other green ingredients für sauce und bringen to boil. Basten der sneaker with mit warm sauce wenn, den, wenn all, almost done. Yammer, yammer. <laughs> sauce making one cup to base in two sneakers. <laughs> <laughs> it's filet of soul. He's cooking his sneakers. <laughs> but all of the ingredients are written. Oh. The the the, the directions are written in in and this one ends with bork bork. Um this one, though, over here at Swedish Chef's Italian Buttered Bread doesn't have any of the fun uh, language in it. Animal. Animal's zesty baked beans. Animal's upside down cornbread. <laughs> so I thought that would be a fun one to end with, uh, to end our month of looking at uh, cookbooks and barbecue, uh, backyard grilling as a subject. Um, I don't know what happened to the music. It seems to have stopped, but you know, whatever. Uh, that is gonna bring us to the end of the stream today. We ran a little bit long, but I, I just had to give time for the Muppet Picnic Cookbook. Um, we will be back next week for another Archival Adventures. Uh, next week and possibly the week after, or, you know, as long as it takes to get through what I pulled today and put on a cart, we will be looking at um, folk medicine and uh, home remedies and um, bitters and that, that type of stuff. Uh, so we have a, a number of different resources there where um, we've got uh, manuscript books and receipt books and uh, various, like, documented home remedies from... Um, times in our past, and so we're going to be looking at those resources next. Um, and I haven't figured out what we're going to look at after that, but um, join me again next week at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time uh, to dive into those home remedies. Um, it should be a lot of fun. Um, I want to thank everybody for stopping by, and thank you to my mods uh, for helping out. Thank you especially to Alice for getting all of the equipment set up um, and figuring out the sound stuff. Uh, let me see who we're going to throw it over to next. Um, uh, doo -doo -doo. Can you guess? They are live. So I think we're going to go over to the Monterey Bay Aquarium for uh, today. They have the penguin cam going. Uh, And so that should be a good time. <laughs> I'm glad that you all are enjoying it. Um, I definitely have been enjoying doing it. Uh, I'm just going to set up that raid. Um, we will be heading over there. Uh, again, thank you all for coming so very, very much. I will be back uh, next week at 2.30, as I said, um, on both VTUL Studios and Rogan27 to do another Archival Adventures live from the Special Collections and University Archives here at Virginia Tech. Thank you all so very much, and I will see you next time. <laughs>